Um, hi, everyone. My name is Joey Katz. I am Director of Special Programming with Boston Jewish Film. Um, thank you for joining us for our second live event, um, a, a part of the fourth annual Boston Israeli Film Festival. Um, you know, I can't say we saved the best for last because, you know, I don't want there. All the films are my favorite children uh, <laughs> in this festival, but I, I'm thrilled for uh, today's conversation um, for a very special, just terrific film. You know, those of you who are joining know how great this film is. Um, we're thrilled to have the director of Cinema Sabaya, Orit Fuchs Rotem. Um, and we're, even, we're also thrilled to have uh, Nahani Rouse, um, host of the Can We Talk podcast, uh, moderating today's conversation. Um, before I turn it over to both of them, just a little bit about today's uh, guest and moderator. Um, so first off, Orit um, was born in Israel in 1983. Um, Cinema Sabia is uh, Orit's debut feature film, which is kind of shocking to me. I feel like it, it's so, uh, well, <laughs> it's so confident and powerful and amazing that, you know, it, I, I was shocked reading that myself. Um, uh, her diploma film uh, from the Sam Spiegel School uh, is called Staring Match. It was screened in festivals all over the world um, and won Best Screenplay at the Tel Aviv Student Film Festival and an honorable mention at the Jerusalem Film Festival. Uh, after graduating from the Sam Spiegel School, Orit co-directed a documentary series for the Israeli channel Yes Daco. Um, she also conducted research for a documentary by the Oscar award-winning director, Alex Gibney, and wrote and directed two short, uh, short fiction films. Um, and again, Cinema Sabia is Orit's debut feature film. Um, thank you for joining us, Orit. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm a bit uh, sick, but I, I try to answer <laughs> in the best way I can. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make it easy for you. It's all good. Um, and uh, our moderator today is Nahani Rouse. Uh, Nahani is the host and senior producer of Can We Talk, the podcast of the Jewish Women's Archive, which explores the intersection of gender, history, and Jewishness. She also produces Those Who Were There, Voices from the Holocaust, a podcast drawn from the recorded testimonies at Yale's Fort Fortinoff video archive for Holocaust tech, uh, testimonies. Um, she's also, she's also been senior producer of Making Gay History, a podcast based on Eric Marcus's decades old audio archive of interviews with LGBTQ activists and was a founding staff member of the media organization Just Vision. Um, Nahani, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is yeah. wonderful and I'm delighted to um, Meet you, Ari. Your film is fantastic. Thank you. All right. Um, without further ado, I think I'm going to hand it over to you too, and I'll see you at the end of the Q and A. Great. So um, I think the format is that I'm going to start out asking a few questions, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So um, start typing your questions into the chat as as soon as they come up. Um, Ori, it's a really wonderful film. Um, I'm really intrigued by the way you blur the lines between genres with this film. Um, it's a feature film, of course, but you do use a lot of film techniques that are common to documentaries. And I know that you wrote the story based on a real experience that you had um, in a film class yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to hear you know, start off by hearing about what that experience was like for you. Um, so actually the idea uh, of this film uh, was brought to me through my mother, uh, which uh, was a participant in one of those groups. <coughs> and uh, I decided uh, it's an interesting platform and I want to, to, uh, to see uh, what, what will I discover by doing it myself as an instructor? And they did uh, groups like this in Accra in Israel and also in Givat Chaviva. And I just met wonderful women and wonderful stories of the, 
and I just started writing it. And um, about the documentary uh, style of the film, it's just uh, part of the, the part of what they wanted it to be because when the women uh, shot shoot the life, it's supposed to look like a documentary. But actually it's not. It's, um, it was all scripted. And, uh, but the actors um, shot it themselves. So that's how we got this, uh, this, this look. Hmm. And yeah, from, what I, all... from what I understand, some of the actors are professional actors and some of them are also regular people, right? Um, so I'd love to, I'm sure everybody would like to hear like who's who and who are the who are the people who are playing themselves and how did how did that all work? Yeah, so Dana Ivgi, which is Rona, is a very famous actor in Israel. Uh, Amal Morkus uh, Nasrin is a famous singer in Israel, and she also acted before. Uh, all the rest are uh, there are professional actors, but. Some of them never acted in their life, like uh, Carmela, which lives in Eyat, mm-hmm. and she, she really does live in Eyat. And I actually met her through my script uh, advisor that is kayaking, and she met her. Uh, and I just put her in the script after I met her. So, so is her like, story, is, is, her, um, is her character written pretty much the way she, like, is that written from her life? Uh, with changes, uh-huh. with changes, but yes, it's based a lot of her, of what she, what I met and what I saw in her. Also, uh, Joanna, who plays uh, Swag, uh, she never acted before as well, uh, but she's very different from the character. Hmm. She's Christian, she's single, uh, she's 28, <laughs> very, very different. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we just... Um, worked with the themes that are relevant to the characters, but with a lot of changes and a lot of adaptations, but with something they can very, they can feel very close to. And is all of the dialogue completely scripted or was some of that um, improvised? Um, the script is, I mean, there was a script, but we improvised a lot. We started with the script every time. And then we just continued uh, the scene improvised. And I found out that I, I used a lot of improvised uh, parts oh, of shooting. Uh, but it's, I think it's half, half improvised, half scripted. Hmm. Were you expecting it to be like that when you started out? No, actually, I, I was sure it will be really scripted. Uh, but then I understood it, the power of the improvising. Hmm and uh, authenticity it brings to the acting. And I just uh, let go and gave them the, the place. And we worked on the characters really well before, so they knew what they would say and I trusted them. And the casting process was very, very, very long. So I knew that we casted the right woman to each, the right woman to each uh, role. Was so, there a particular moment when you realized that the improvised material was going to be a lot stronger than you had originally thought and that you'd you'd sort of allow that to emerge? I think we did only two rehearsals with all the group. And in the second rehearsal, um, we did the scene where Carmela and uh, Suad are doing the... Um, the the role of the husband and the, and the swag and I saw that they're starting to have something interesting then we stopped it and then I understood yeah we need to use it uh, it's much more powerful than what I wrote hmm. and it's um, it's much more natural when they do it so we just I, I came to the shooting with this idea of letting them improvise as much as possible hmm. but but we did also because it's my first film and I never used uh, improvising before. So I wanted it to have also the text and also to improvise. So we had this long text of the woman <laughs> almost died in the end, like uh, 
half an hour take of a, of a, a conversation between eight women. So it was very, uh, yeah, it was difficult, but it was a very interesting process. And we learned it in every day much more. So the, the issue of language is a, almost the first thing that comes up when the youngest participant, um, Nahed, asks why the course is going to be in Hebrew if there are also Arabic speakers there. Um, and the older Arab woman says to her in Arabic that they all speak Hebrew, so that's the way it is. And, you know, that was just such a familiar dynamic to me from my own work in spaces like this in, in Israel and Palestine. And you chose to bring it out right away. So I, I was interested to hear why that was one of the first things that you wanted to, to put in the film. It actually was one of the first questions I got from Arab actresses that came to auditions. They said, so it's about both sides and you, and it's in, all in Hebrew. And I understood it has to be in Hebrew because technically that's the, the language that we all speak in Israel. It's bad, but that's the, that's the way it is. I mean, I don't know Arabic. And, and also the instructor in such group would, wouldn't know Arabic. I also taught uh, Arab women that they all, were all Arab and I spoke in Hebrew because that's, what, that's the way it works here. And it's, it's a problem, but I wanted it to be the first thing to say because it's like, I, I'm aware of it, but I want to fix it in this film. I need to, I need to, to put it on the table, but, and, uh, I, I, I did try that some of the dialogues and some of the monologues will be in Arabic because naturally it, they, they write the voiceover of this and they speak between them in Arabic. But they wanted it to be as loyal to reality as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a very interesting, um, you know, in addition to, of course, getting that sort of political reality out there, it created a very interesting storytelling vehicle because then you have this like almost um, secret other language to convey something about the relationship between some of the women. Um, and, and when I was thinking about the, the power dynamic that language creates, like of course there's this thing of um, the Jewish women get to speak the language that they're most comfortable with, but then there's also a power in having a kind of secret language, right? That some of some people in the room don't understand. Yeah. Um, and I loved that the first time that really comes into play is when the older woman says to the younger woman about driving, like don't do anything behind your husband's back. And it's just, it was so fascinating that that was a thing that she chose to say in Arabic. Yeah. Did you script that in, that she was would say that in Arabic? Uh, yeah, that was scripted actually. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I think, again, I think it's much more powerful to speak in the language you think. Uh, but yeah, there is uh, some, some advantages in, in speaking behind the back of the, of the people in the room, but... Uh, yeah, unfortunately, this is the situation here that we don't, we all know Hebrew, but we don't know Arabic. Um, the film showcases film itself as a powerful medium for witnessing other people's lives. And I'm, I'm thinking of that first homework assignment um, where everybody brings in clips from their own homes. And, and there's so much conveyed even in a few seconds of seeing inside someone's house, even when, you know, like at first glance, I would look at those clips and think there's not, you know, such great, cinemato cinem great cinematography in them, but there really is because there's so much to learn from them. Um, what were you thinking about when you designed that scene? Um... I wanted it to be as much uh, as much natural as, as it can be. So, for instance, when Gila shows her house, uh, it was my uh, friend's mo uh, my mother's friend's house, 
And I just gave her the camera and I told her, just show me your house. And that's what she did. And this is her husband. And then uh, I just uh, recorded the, the actor. And we, we used this material that was improvised in the minutes that I was there. Um, so this is, was the, the big challenge for me to, that it will be, that it will communicate, but it won't be like um, too much beautiful or trying to be documentary just to make it real. Mm. So every time I found another way to do it. Um, for instance, in Carmela's uh, laughs, uh, we just gave her the camera and she did it herself. And they didn't really know exactly what it would be from it in the end, but I think it, it added some value to it also. Just do it as, as an assignment, like you would do. Um, the other thing I love um, from a, you know, the perspective of somebody who makes, creates media is the, um, the collection of room tone, you know, when she's teaching them to collect room tone yeah. um, and what they all notice while they're observing that moment of silence. And I, you know, I love those moments myself in an interview and I actually really miss them because I haven't been doing interviews in person for two years. It's yeah. that like moment after you've done this whole interview when you're forced to sit with another person's presence in quiet and sort of experience each other's presence in a different way. And, um, you know, they notice the, 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 the woman who has the hijab like notices it on her ear and um, Carmela talks about the, the yam tone, the tone of the sea. Um, what is the what is what does that room tone scene mean to you? Um, yeah, I wanted it to be like an, uh, something that happened in the audience while you're watching the film to be in a one minute of quiet. I wanted the audience to feel it also, just the presence of this woman and the presence of everybody surrounding. Every time in sets uh, when we do a room tone, I'm really uh, touched for it. Uh, that gave me the idea because it's really special, like the world stops and, uh, and just listen. <laughs> and I thought it's a beautiful uh, thing to show, just to, to look at someone's lip, to, to look at someone's lip. I think it's one of the most beautiful things I think there is. It really is. It's such a, it's such an unintended or like you would think it's an unintended consequence of just the need to, to sort of do something very technical actually yeah. really brings you into the heart of a medium. Yeah, I agree. Um, so the filmmaker's presence in the story is really interesting and seems complicated. Um, or it gets more complicated, I guess, as the story progresses. Um, what were you trying to convey with, with the filmmaker's role? You talk about Rona? You mean about yeah. the, the role of Rona? Um, well, actually, at the beginning, she had a very, um, she, she had a backstory, and she had a life, and I, I even shot it a bit. Um, and then slowly I understood that it's not, uh, it's not the heart of the, the movie. Uh, maybe in more classical film, there's a hero that goes through uh, something that, there's, that changes her in, in a way. But here uh, I understood after, after doing the film that uh, she's, she just has to be like what I experienced. She has to be like the eyes that, that see the, this woman. And of course, there is, she has a motive. She wants to make a film. But I didn't want her to, to have too, ma too much um, of a story so she wouldn't take uh, the heart from what I wanted it to be. And that's the woman and her story. 
and so I decided in the editing room actually to to let her be just the instructor and the the person that makes it all happen and and watches it and happy that it that it can watch it she can watch it but but they didn't want it to be um to be more than that because I felt it it's what she has to be but of course her motive is to get them to open up and to to share themselves more to the women uh, it's both it's also for the film that she wanted to make but also from her own interest and I think that we as filmmakers do it all the time we are really curious about people and but we also need it for something that we want to promote so this dilemma is part of my biggest dilemma in this business, <laughs> if I can call it business. And it's that issue of, of trust, right? Like, yeah, also... It's, also, it's not just trust, it's about your motives. Um, because she wouldn't do anything without, with it. I didn't take the story to a place where she, she put publish it or do something with it. It's only her intentions that are not are not only to know them, but also to gain something from it by making a film. And this is interesting for me as a filmmaker to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what reactions you've gotten when you've shown the film in Israel. The reactions are actually really strong. It still didn't uh, published in Israel. It will be in May. Um, but uh, it will go out to cinemas in May, but we had a lot of uh, uh, pre-screening and people really think it's a documentary, which for me is very fun and weird because Gale Ivgi is the most famous actor in Israel, uh, but still they, people tell themselves, why is it still a documentary? And in the end, uh, people are shocked uh, to discover it's all uh, scripted. And uh, for me, it was a surprise. I mean, I knew it's confusing, but I didn't expect these reactions uh, so strong. And I think um, what I saw that each one um, can find the, the character to identify with. And, uh, everyone has the favorite character. Uh, to Do you do also have a favorite character? No, I mean, I love them all. Of course, Suad's story is really uh, strong, and I think she's one of the most strong uh, stories in the film, but uh, they're all my, uh, <laughs> my daughters. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if you've thought about this um, at all, but I was curious if, you know, I kept on wondering what happens to all of these women after. Um, so in your imagination, like what is, what is Suad doing next and, and what happens for some of these women after the course? Yeah, so I thought about it. I mean, Suad, uh, unfortunately, I think she's in a trap. I don't think she will change her life dramatically. I think this period of time of the course gave her some light in her life, but in the end, she has six kids. She's married. She lives in a very specific place. And she, maybe she'll do more than she would have done. But I don't think, unfortunately, that her life will change her. Um, yeah, I think, I think each of them got something by this, uh, by meeting those other women. But uh, it's very hard to make a big change in life, you know. So I think uh, what what happened was the change, what happened in this group. But I don't know if it will be a dramatic change after. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. We have a question here from Mary, who says, "Thank you for your wonderful film. I'm curious about the role playing scene with the woman who wants her license. That would be Suad." Right, and the woman playing her husband, Carmela, is rather aggressive. 
how much of that was improvised. I think you talked about, you said that a lot of that was improvised, but let's talk a little bit more about it. I mean, she did get very aggressive and I, I was actually, I, I started feeling uncomfortable when I was watching it. I'm what, um, just tell us about the atmosphere in the room while you were doing that scene. Yeah, well, we shot it for two takes only. And before the shooting, we knew that, we knew that she's supposed to, to give her heart, that Carmela should not make it easy for her. I didn't know she would take it to that. So that, that came to me. Um, but we did know that Suad will lose her temper and something will happen. We didn't know what will happen exactly. And uh, I think that because I, I did tell, tell the actor, Lioha, Carmela, I told her, don't make it easy for her. Try to, to make her uh, demand what she wants. And she did it. She went all the way with it. <laughs> and actually, when Suad get, get, goes to her, she just dropped herself off. Uh, Carmela herself just did it. And so um, Joanna was surprised. She didn't know that she would do it. And neither, neither do I. Mm -hmm. I think this is what helped it to be so natural. And everybody was like shocked. Also the cinematographer and, and everybody. Because I really thought she fell. But I thought she's all right and we continued. But yeah, part of the... The success of the of the authenticity was that it really happened in in a way. Of course, we all knew the rules, but I wouldn't let her hit. But but we all in, were inside it, and um, and yeah, I think also uh, Joanna didn't expect Leora to be so harsh. But uh, when you give somebody a role, sometimes you can take it uh, very. Uh, very far huh. and uh, and I'm happy she did it because I think this is what gives the, the scene the strength I mean uh, she tried to be as much as her husband as she could imagine huh. and she yeah. did it what was the rapport like between all the women in the cast what? the rapport like what was the relationship between all the women in the in the cast like yeah, well, for me, it looks like there is harmony uh, because while shooting, I was very into the shooting. On set, it felt really good. Um, but after I heard that, of course, when you put so many women together, 12, it was only 12 days of shooting. Oh, wow. But it, yeah, it was challenging. But... Um, the, the, of course, everybody is a human being, and, and you, you shot a film, everybody wants to be on the center of it. Uh, not everybody, but some of the actors want it more. And when you provide it, it's more difficult to control it because there's not now you, now you, it's like when you want. So a lot of it, of course, is out of the film, but I did saw that it was, I did see it was a, a conflict about how much am, am I inside the film? And it's interesting to see because uh, in the end, this is the, what we all want, the territory and more space. And uh, it was also like this in the, in the cast. But we are all now in good, uh, in good connections. We have a, a WhatsApp group and everybody are, I mean, we meet. Uh, yesterday I was visiting Marlene, uh, which plays a water. So everybody are really connected. We we like this. Uh, all the actors. So um, we have a question here about the end credits, which I I don't totally understand this question because I don't remember this part. But it says there's a green screen behind the actors. What did you intend to put behind them? Yeah, it was a big dilemma, the green screen. I, this is the dreams coming true. Uh, when, at the beginning of the film, you want to ask them to tell about their dreams. And they want that in the green screen, it will be like, uh, 
a reflection of each dream. Gila says she wants to be a grandmother. I want to be like a grand, grand uh, daughter's room. And uh, for each one, something else. But I thought it's more interesting to leave it green because this is cinema. I mean, then it's in the ending credits, so it's part of the dreams that cannot, something that cannot be completed and, and really come true in real life. So for me, it was more interesting to leave it like that in the end. But it was a very serious dilemma for me. If to do. Um, here's another question about the line between <coughs> portrayal and exploitation when you're a storyteller or a filmmaker showing people's people's lives. How do you know when you're crossing that line? Uh, of course, it's not scientific. I mean, everybody feels it different. For me, I just feel it uh, in my in my stomach when I feel. Uh, I'm stop, I stop looking at human beings as human beings and start looking at them as characters. Something is mixed. And, and for me, that's a problem in doing documentary sometimes. It depends, of course, it's not every documentary, but for instance, to do this film in a documentary uh, way, uh, it was, for me, it wasn't uh, an option. I thought about it. and. After I understood how little these women can know about what I'm doing, if I'm doing it in a good documentary way, I decided to do it in a fiction. Yeah, but I think it's uh, individual. Everybody, there's no rules to it, unfortunately. There's no really written ethics for a cinema. What do you have in mind to work on next? Um, I have some ideas that are like still, I can't really talk about it because uh, they are still uh, under thinking. But uh, I did a documentary about Amal Murkus, the singer, uh, that was in Channel One in, the, in Israel just uh, one month ago. And I'm writing uh, also for Channel One a series with uh, some more uh, writers. Uh, it's about love. And, and, and the topic is about love. And um, yeah, there is some ideas, but not something I can talk about <laughs> yet. Really I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to um, seeing your next work. And I think, um, Ori, yeah, I, I hear that your voice is uh, your, your. Thank you for bearing with us for so long yeah, with this. Sorry, that's it. No, no, no. It's uh, it's totally, totally understood. Refuash um, Well, thank you, Ori. Again, yeah, I, we're we're all hoping you get well soon. Um, thank you. Um, and we also look forward to you know your future work. Um, and Nahani, thank you so much for leading this uh, really eye-opening, fascinating discussion. Um, and thank you all for uh, joining in and taking part, submitting your questions. Um, so this uh, is the last virtual event for the festival, but um, we do have a closing night event on uh, the 30th, which is coming up very soon um, for Let It Be Morning at the Coolidge Corner Theater at seven o'clock. Um, and you can also still watch Cinema Sabaya um, on our website um, that is available to stream until March 30th. Um, so uh, for those of you attending here, please share it far and wide. Tell everyone you know in Massachusetts to watch it. Actually, it's available to watch throughout the entire US. So even beyond Massachusetts, people should be watching this amazing film. Um, so thank you, Orit, for making this fantastic film being with us and uh nahani thank you and uh thank you all for joining and uh have a great rest of the day bye thank you thank bye, you everybody bye, bye. bye.